number of serious cases, a new indicator for phase transitions. Daily COVID-19 cases exceed 20,000 for the first time. Hello and good evening. I'm Amin Carlos and welcome to News at 10. Well, the number of severe COVID-19 cases will become the new indicator for transitions to Phase 2 and Phase 3 of the National Recovery Plan, the PPN. Now, its coordinating minister, Tenku Dato Sri Zafrul Tenku Abdulaziz, said the indicator will be based on cases admitted to hospitals under Category 3, 4 and 5. It replaced the previous indicator, which is the daily new infections. However, other indicators such as vaccination rate as well as ICU beds usage will remain. Telah mencapai kadar vaksinasi 40% penduduk dewasa dan ke atas, bilangan kes baru COVID menjadi kurang relevan kerana kebanyakan kes adalah kes yang tidak bergejala ataupun bergejala ringan, iaitu kategori 1 dan 2 sekaligus mengurangkan beban terhadap infrastruktur kesihatan awam. Apa yang lebih penting dalam pemantauan dan penilaian peralihan ke fasa 3 dan selanjutnya adalah kes bergejala serius iaitu kategori 3, 4 dan 5. Tengku Datu Sri Zafrul said this during the 64th Laksana briefing at his personal social media page. He added, based on data and observation gathered in Sarawak and Labuan, has proved that high vaccination rate is effective in reducing the number of Category 3, 4 and 5 cases. The capacity of beds in public and private hospitals treating COVID-19 patients in the Greater Klang Valley or GKV area will be increased by repurposing some areas in the hospital into patient wards. GKV Special Task Force, GKV SCF Commander Dato Dr. Chong Chi Kyung said this was in light of the current situation and spread of the pandemic in GKV encompassing Selangor, Kuala Lumpur and also Negeri Sembilan. So in a statement, Dato Dr. Chong said another initiative, namely outsourcing non-COVID-19 patients to private hospitals was also being done to further free up more beds in the hospitals for use by COVID-19 patients. He said the ambulance service is also upgraded with the cooperation of numerous agencies, including the Malaysian Civil Defense Force, Fire and Rescue Department, and non-government organizations or NGOs, such as the Malaysian Red Crescent Society. In addition, home isolations and virtual monitorings by the COVID-19 assessment centers are conducted for COVID-19 patients with mild or no symptoms. Well, he said GKV SGF is also working together with NGOs and volunteers in identifying and tracing close contacts. To date, in GKV, there are 29 public hospitals and 51 private hospitals, as well as two low-risk treatment centers or PKRCs, including four full COVID-19 hospitals, namely Ampang, Selayang, Sungai Bulo, and Serdang Hospital. The federal government is targeting to get at least 40% of Johor's adult population inoculated by 31st August as it ramps up COVID-19 vaccination in the sect. Well, Prime Minister Tan Sri Mohyeddin Yassin said he had directed National COVID-19 Immunization Program or PICK Coordinating Minister Kari Jamaluddin and Health Minister Dr. Sri Dr. Adam Baba to look into the situation regarding the vaccination program in Johor. Di sudut uh, bekalan, sepatutnya kita tidak jadi masalah kerana kita dah tempah lebih daripada 130% uh, keperluan negara. Bermana sudah ada lebihan, tapi dia tak sampai dalam jadual waktu yang kita nak. Kalau hari ini katakan sejuta, dia datang setengah juta. Uh, kerana tuntutan di peringkat global untuk perkara ini adalah amat tinggi. The Premier said overall Malaysia had achieved a vaccination level that the country can be proud of and added that the government will 
have further increased the level. Well, he said with the intensified vaccination, more economic sectors can be opened. Well, recently, Sultan of Johor, Sultan Ibrahim, Sultan Iskandar voices disappointment with the low vaccination rate in the same. Now, the ruler said he and Tunku Mahkota Johor, Tunku Ismail, Sultan Ibrahim had long discussions with the relevant parties to ask for more vaccine so that Johor could achieve herd immunity as soon as possible. Malaysia reported a record 20,596 new cases of COVID-19 today, breaching the 20,000 mark for the first time. Now, today also saw the death toll surpass the 10,000 mark. To date, the cumulative of confirmed cases since last year are 1,203,706 cases. Selangor recorded the highest new infections today with 8,549 new infections. Other states with more than 1,000 cases are Kuala Lumpur, Kedah, Johor, Sabah and Pulau Pina. And of today's new infections, 398 or 1.98% of them are category 3, 4 and 5 patients while 98.1% or 20,198 others are asymptomatic and those with mild symptoms. 13,893 patients had made full recoveries in the last 24 hours taking the country's total recovery to 976,626 or 81.13% of total cases. There are 217 1,061 active cases in the country, 1,078 cases are currently receiving treatment at the ICU and 549 of them required respiratory assistance. 164 new death cases reported by the health ministry today, taking the country's death toll past the 10,000 mark to 10,019 deaths since February last year. A medical expert, Professor Dato Dr. Adiba Kamarol Zaman, said the government should be spending about 7 to 8 percent of the country's gross domestic product or GDP to improve the healthcare system. While she noted that although the budget allocation for healthcare was the second highest after education, it was only at about 4 percent of GDP. And according to the World Bank data, the country's healthcare expenditures stood at 3.75% of GDP in 2018. In budget 2021, the overall allocation to the health ministry increased from 30.6 billion to 31.9 billion ringgit, a 4.3% increase year on year. Dr. Dr. Adiba said the healthcare transformation and strengthening of primary healthcare in the country is crucially needed to address the aging population and the increase of non-communicable diseases and to manage threats of future future pandemics. In containing COVID-19, she noted that there are no automated testing systems and most things are still done manually. Therefore, she recommended an expansion in testing and contact tracing while the isolation and support of those infected by COVID-19 need to be continued. Dr. Dr. Adiba also called on employers, especially those with foreign workers, to be more responsible for any outbreak that happens in their premises. She cited Singapore as an example where the disease was controlled by ensuring adequate and proper housing for migrant workers besides vaccinations and regular testings. Parti Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia, Bersatu Deputy President Dato Sri Ahmad Faisal Azumu has been appointed as Special Advisor to Prime Minister Tantri Muhyiddin Yassin with ministerial status. Now, the announcement was made in a statement issued by the Prime Minister's office earlier today. And the PMOs or the Prime Minister's office announced that the Tambun MP and former Perak Menteri Besar will be responsible for advising the Prime Minister on matters of community networking, communications and socio-economic development. The office congratulates him on this appointment. Up next, Side Sadiq pleads not guilty to new money laundering charges.
And now news continues. Now, Muar member of parliament Said Sadiq Said Abdul Rahman pleaded not guilty at the Johor Bahru Sessions Court today to two counts of money laundering amounting to 100,000 ringgit three years ago. Well, a 29 year old former youth and sports minister entered the plea before Judge Dato Ahmad Kamal Arifin Ismail. Well, according to the charges, Said Sadiq was alleged to have been involved in money laundering, whereby two transactions of 50,000 ringgit were transferred from his Maybank Islamic Burhad account in to his Amana Saham Bumiputra account, which were proceeds from illegal activities. Now, the offences were allegedly committed at a bank in Jalan Persisiran Perling, Taman Perling, on 16th and 19th June 2018. Now, the charges framed under Section 4, Subsection 1, Subsection B of the Anti-Money Laundering, Anti-Terrorism and Proceeds of Unlawful Activities Act 2001 Punishable under Section 4, Subsection 1 of the same Act provides for imprisonment not exceeding 15 years and a fine of not less than five times the sum or value of the proceeds of an unlawful activity if convicted. Earlier, Deputy Public Prosecutor Wan Shaharuddin Wan Ladin proposed that the court apply the bail set by the Kuala Lumpur Sessions Court on 22nd July. Wan Shaharuddin also applied for the case to be transferred to the Kuala Lumpur Sessions Court in accordance with Section 123 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Counsel Gobind Singh Dio, representing Said Sari, did not object to the bail proposal and the application to transfer the case. The court then allowed the case to be transferred to the Kuala Lumpur Sessions Court and fix 10 in September for re-mention. A People's Volunteer Corps RELA personnel who was charged with the murder of his best friend yesterday was brought before the Kuala Trunganu Sessions Court today to face an attempted murder charge. Ong Chao Lee, 57, was charged with the attempted murder of Tio Hog Bing, 45, who is the nephew of his murdered best friend. Now, the accused pleaded guilty to the charge which was read to him before Judge Noria Osman. Well, Ong was alleged to have committed the act in a hut behind a Chinese temple next to the neighborhood watch beat base hut in Taman Raya Wakaf Tapai at about 1.55 p.m. on 23rd July. He was charged under Section 307 of the Penal Code, which provides a maximum jail term of 20 years if convicted. Well, the court set 17th October for case mention. Now, Deputy Public Prosecutor Wan Amira Ruzani Wan Abdul Razak prosecuted while the accused was unrepresented. Now, yesterday, Ong was charged in the Marang Magistrates Court with the murder of the Taman Raya Rukun Tatanga Deputy Chairman Fong Sui Fuan, 65, who is also his best friend at the same location and time. Well, a total of 54 million ringgit out of the 89.2 million ringgit allocated under the Malaysian Creative Industry Stimulus Package, known as PRISMA, has so far been dispensed to creative industry practitioners in the country. Well, Communications and Multimedia Minister Dato Saifuddin Abdullah said the government is targeting to give out the remaining funds to creative industry practitioners before the end of the year. To date, more than 14,000 recipients from the film, digital creative content and music industry have benefited from the assistance. Uh, untuk filem sebelum ni pun kita ada um, dah bagi uh, sejumlah dana juga kepada penggiat-penggiat filem. Yang uh, hiburan dari rumah itu kita belanja lebih kurang 6 juta untuk uh, lebih kurang 900 uh, penyanyi dan pemuzik. Dan uh, kita bantu untuk industri filem ni bukan sahaja dari segi production tetapi juga kita memberi sedikit sebanyak subsidi membantu mereka untuk sanitasi tempat kerja mereka juga uh, subsidi untuk buat swab test. Sebagai contoh, bila MKN benarkan buat penggambaran tapi di luar studio, di kawasan-kawasan tertentu semasa PKP. 
Dato Saifuddin said this after attending a virtual signing ceremony of a memorandum of understanding for the Creative Industry Immediate Economic Action Plan Palaksana of the Digital Content Fund or DKD between the National Film Development Corporation Malaysia, Finas and Sarawak Media Group SMG today. Now through this cooperation, 2.9 million ringgit will be allocated for nine collaborative projects between Finas and SMG in the production of creative content. While small and medium enterprises or SMEs have been urged to take advantage of the benefits that come with the program strategic Memperkasa Rakyat dan Ekonomi or Pemerkasa introduced by the government. SME Corp Malaysia Chief Executive Officer Rizal Naini said studies show that SMEs are badly affected during the COVID-19 pandemic and some may even have to close down by October this year. And elaborating further, Rizal said through Permarkasa's flexible and fast financing scheme, SMEs would be able to get assistance in strengthening their business capabilities, better manage their finance, and most important of all, is able to sustain or maybe even expand their businesses. Now, at the same time, Rizal said the move to reopen the country's economic sector in stages is also important to ensure the process of economic recovery for SMEs can be achieved successfully. However, he stressed that the reopening of several branches of the economic sector during this movement control period must also take into account several aspects, including the successful implementation of the COVID-19 screening and vaccination processes. Malaysia's per capita income is expected to increase this year. However, this would be subject to the country's economic recovery. Well, according to Chief Statistician Datu Sri Dr. Mohamed Uzir Mahidin, the recovery pattern of the economic sectors in the country is projected to be uneven, thus affecting salaries and wages. Now, that's what Dr. Mohamed Uzair said. If the government succeeds in its efforts to enhance the country's digital economy and development of technologies in economic activities in the long run, the average income measured in terms of salaries and wages will definitely increase. He said measures to curb the spread of COVID-19 also resulted in the mean monthly salaries and wages received by local workers dropping by 9.0% year on year to 2,933 ringgit in 2020 from 3,224 ringgit in 2019. Meanwhile, the national labor force participation rate fell by 0.3 percentage points to 68.4 percent compared to 68.7 percent in 2019. The unemployment rate also increased to a near three-decade high at 4.5 percent in 2020. The COVID-19 health crisis left a profound impact on the country's socio-economic landscape, with Malaysia's overall gross domestic product or GDP contracting by 5.6 percent in 2020, the second lowest since 1998. And Dr. Sri Dr. Mohamed Uzer added Malaysia's inflation rate stood at minus 1.2% in 2020 with the most affected groups were transport, housing, water, electric city, gas and other fuels. Well, at the same time, travel restrictions across states and districts have also impacted the country's domestic tourism industry as Malaysia's domestic tourism expenditure in 2020 plummeted by 60.8% to 40.4 billion ringgit from 103.2 billion ringgit back in 2019. Toronto FC or TFC revived their pursuit of Super League leaders Johor Darul Takzim or JDT by beating Petaling Jaya City FC 3-0 at the Petaling Jaya City Council Stadium yesterday. While the Turtles open account in the 13th minute through imported player Marcel Nguessen to give the team relief after their draw with Sabah on Sunday. Well, in the second half, the Holmeses failed to make any headway and instead, TFC's David Da Selva widened their lead in the 89th minute before Rahmat Makassov scored his team's third goal in the final minutes. Now with the victory, TFC are now second in the table with 34 points, eight points behind JDT.
In another match, Sabah FC drew one all with Kuala Lumpur City FC at Stadium Likas in Kota Kinabalu. Kuala Lumpur City FC took the lead when Sabah FC defender Randy Barrow scored an own goal in the 23rd minute before Sabah FC equalized in the 66th minute through Levi Madinda's goal. In Premier League action, Project FAM MSN lost 1-2 to Negri Sambilan FC at Stadium University Technology Mara or UITM in Shah Alam. And coach K. Devon's squad made sure Project FAM MSN remained winless after scoring through a penalty by Alain Ferry Akono in the 10th minute and skipper Mohamed Zakwan Anha Abdul Razak in the 54th minute. Project FAM MSN solitary goal was netted by Ashad Haraz Arman in the 66th minute. Well, that's it from us this evening. And our top story, well, number of serious cases, new indicator for phase transitions. So join us for updates at noon at 12.30 tomorrow. I'm Mohamed Amin Carlos. Thanks for watching. Have a pleasant evening.